Hello and welcome back to Rock Records Reviewed. My name's Adam and this week we're going to take a look at the post-1970s output of David Bowie. I think it's fair to say that most people would agree that his best work was done in the 70s, certainly his most consistent work, uh, and we've looked at that in another show previously. Um, but uh, post-1970s, uh, his work was much patchier, um, he was equally as experimental, um, but a lot of people would say he never made a cons one consistently great record, and that may or may not be true, we'll talk about it, but he certainly made some great songs that are worth investigating. Um, at times, some of his output was almost ridiculed, um, uh, mentioning no names, Tin Machine, um, but uh, that seems almost ridiculous now that he's kind of been deified since his death. But we've got a lot of records to get through, 15 records to get through, including Tin Machine. Um, so let's get straight into it. Um, at number 15 from um, um, 1984, his 16th album, Tonight. Now, Tonight was the follow up to the hugely successful Let's Dance, which was his biggest seller up to that point and uh, it propelled him into the sort of multi million uh, selling uh, artists category. Um, I think by his own admission this album was driven by commerciality. He sort of lost his way a little bit. There's a couple of good songs, Loving the Alien and Blue Jean is a nice pop song, but there are a lot of covers, they're not very good covers. The whole thing sounds a bit like somebody else is in control and I think that's exactly what was happening. Tumble and Twirl, Neighbourhood Threat, these are poor Bowie songs. Um, and, and, and God Only Knows, there's a cover on here of God Only Knows, it adds nothing to the original. Um, Rolling Stone gave this album one star out of five, which gives you a very good idea of, of uh, just how good or bad it may be. And number 14 from 1997, his 20th album, Earthling. Now, Earthling is an interesting Bowie record because he uh, it's, a, it's a drum and bass record. Um, other words used to describe it are techno, electronica, jungle. I have to admit, these are not uh, types of music I have a great deal of in my record collection. Um, but I have a theory about artists that if you buy into an artist um, wholeheartedly then you go with it, you go up and down through all the good and bad records they've made. So if you follow people like Dylan and uh, Neil Young and David Bowie then you're inevitably going to come across some more challenging records but you stay with it, you wonder why they made them, you try and understand what uh, motivated them and for Bowie he is an artist so I, I, I listen to this record a lot and it really just isn't my thing. I'm Afraid of Americans is, is a good track, Little Wonder isn't bad um, but it kind of got a lukewarm reception because I think you know even in the style that it's uh, trying to be it's perhaps not necessarily the best example of those genres. Uh, at number 13 Tin Machine 2 from 1991. Tin Machine was the band Bowie put together to just try and find his mojo again um, after sort of being caught up in the corporate world of, 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 of million selling records in the 80s um, and, and other people dictating what he should be doing. I think he just wanted to break free so he put a bunch of guys together and made a couple of records. This was the second of them from uh, 1991. Um, uh, Goodbye Mr. Red and Shopping for Girls are really good songs I think. Um, uh, it's a bit more melodic than the first Tin Machine record uh, but there are a lot of songs on here that weren't written by Bowie and, and as such it, it, it doesn't feel completely like a Bowie record even though he's playing on it and singing on it. Uh, it, sort of, it feels like a band record which I think is what he was going for but it, not particularly good one. Uh, and number 12 from 1999 his 21st album Hours um, this was the last of his uh, records for EMI and this was also the first album ever to be fully available as a download on the internet. Bowie was always very ahead of the curve with technology and things like that. It was his first album in 27 years not to make the top 40 which gives you a good idea of just how off the radar Bowie had fallen. Um, there's nothing unpleasant on this record at all but at the same time there's nothing about it that sticks to the wall whatsoever. Thursday's Child was the single, and I'm sure you don't remember that at all. Um, and I hate to say, but in the words of uh, Villanelle from Killing, Killing Eve, um, this record is boring. Um, and that's an awful thing to say about an artist such as David Bowie. 
Um, number 11 uh, from 1989, uh, the first Tin Machine album. Uh, now, Bowie was getting a critical mauling in the 80s um, and he just needed to jump off that commercial bandwagon and reclaim the fun of just getting together with people and making music. So he got together with Reeve, Reeves Gabrels on guitar and Hunt and Tony Sales on bass and drums. They were from the Iggy Pop band. And this is a good a garage rock uh, band album. You can hear the amps humming and you can hear the strings uh, scratching away. I Can't Read, Heaven's In Here, Prisoner of Love. They're all pretty good songs. Um, I think Reeves Gabrell's work is a little bit messy and wild for me. Um, but I think this record was pr pretty crucial in revitalizing Bowie and, and falling in love with music again. Um, number 10. Uh, from 1995, his 19th album, One Outside, or also known as Outside. This album saw him reunited with Brian Eno, with whom he'd made uh, the, the Berlin Trilogy albums. Um, and this is an interesting concept album about a murder in the art world. Um, and there's a lot of narration between the songs. Um, you know, what I like about this record is you can really hear that Bowie's trying again. He's re-engaged with his muse and he's he's he sounds interested again which he really didn't on a lot of uh, uh, uh late 80s early 90s records um some of these songs have had a really good uh, shelf life uh, i have not been to oxford town hearts filthy lesson we prick you these are really really good songs i uh, i urge you to check out hearts filthy lesson has been used on a lot of films it's a great sounding record um i think the album's too long I think it's quite a dense package of music. I find it quite hard to listen to in one sitting, but that doesn't mean there isn't some really good stuff on here if you're willing to sort of pick through it a little bit. Um, uh, number nine from 1987, 17th album, and this will surprise a lot of people because it's, a, it's an album that gets absolutely panned all the time. Never Let Me Down. Um, some people hate this record, but I actually have fond memories of it. Um, it was on the this album's tour, um, that I saw Bowie for the first time in 1987 uh, on the Glass Spider tour. I was down the front uh, in a sea of screaming girls. Uh, happy days. Um, I do think there are some songs on here. It sounds very, very 80s. Um, and, and some of the songs are ridiculous. You know, Glass Spider um, is, is, is a bit daft. But um, I think there are songs on here. And actually, this album was re-recorded uh, with less 80s sounding arrangements and instruments on a box set released last year called Loving the Alien. And I think I was proven right. Um, songs like Time Will Crawl and um, Never Let Me Down, New York's In Love, uh, um, uh, Shining Star, Making My Love. I think they're quite good songs. It's not a brilliant record, It's a, you know, and it is inconsistent. But again, there are some lovely things to be found if you stick with it and you ignore the critics. Uh, number eight, 1993, Buddha of Suburbia. Now, this is an interesting one because this was originally released as a soundtrack to a Hanif Koresh TV series. Um, but this was a really important record because he'd just come out of Tin Machine and people were wondering what he was going to do next. And he just released this and it went completely under the radar. But there's some really good stuff on here. The title track, Buddha of Suburbia dead against it, strangers when we meet. And there's some very, very good, very Bowie-ish experimental sort of art jazz on here as well. Um, I, I think that, you know, this was an important record in, in for Bowie fans because it was like, yeah, hang on a second, there's some, there's some good stuff on here. He's still got it. He hasn't gone and thrown it all away like he'd done with um, Tonight and he hadn't, uh, you, you know, he wasn't sort of too bogged down in Tin Machine. He'd cast all that off and it sounded like he was a little bit more re-energised again. Um, Bowie's actually himself said that this was one of his favourite albums he ever made. And in 2007, it was re-released as a proper album um, because it had barely got any notice on its first release. So it had a, a new artwork and everything. Um, from no number seven from um, 2003, his 23rd album, Reality. Uh, but so by now the Renaissance is kind of in in full flow. Um, the album prior to this, Heathen had been well received because he joined up again with Tony Visconti and his classic producer from the 70s, and they carried on this relationship through to reality. Um, this has got some really good songs on it: New Killer Star, Full Dog Bombs the Moon, Bring Me the Disco King, Looking for Water. Uh, it's littered with really really fine Bowie songs. Um, there's also a George Harrison tribute in Try Some Buy Some, a cover. 
Um, there are some great vocals on this record. Bowie was rediscovering his voice. Apparently he'd given up smoking for this record and was finding his range again. Um, but this is a very, very solid uh, post-1970s David Bowie record. And in fact, all the records from here on in, um, I heartily recommend anyone goes to check them out if you're unfamiliar with uh, his his uh, his um, more um, what's the word um, unheralded work I think is probably the best way to say number six 1993 his 18th album black tie white noise so for this album he reunited with Niall Rogers with whom he'd had all that massive commercial success on let's dance so the expectations were were sky high um, this isn't a bad record at all, but it is fatally too long. And if you watch my um, shows regularly, you'll know how much I despair when an album goes over 45 minutes. Um, but its best moments are very, very good. Um, Jump, they say, was the single. Black Tie, White Noise, Miracle Good Night. Um, there's a fantastic cover of uh, Morrissey's I Know It's Gonna Happen Someday. Um, and there's an awful cover of Cream's I Feel Free. Uh, which was the last time he ever recorded with Mick Ronson, who's on guest guitar. The album's kind of funky. Um, it's it's certainly got a feel and an atmosphere to it. It has a couple of instrumentals. I, I really like it, but I like it on CD where I can skip forward a couple of the less, um, less pleasant moments. Um, at number five from 2002, his 22nd album, Heathen. Now, um, this was the album I was saying earlier. He was back with Tony Visconti. And this and reality are often sort of seen as a brother and sister album. Um, what's great about Heathen is he really sounds... <coughs> he sounds focused. <coughs> Excuse me. He sounds focused. Um, the sequencing is much, much better than we've had before. It just sounds like he's just more interested in the whole thing than he has been for years. But his vocals are great. Everything stepped up a level here. Slip Away, 515, The Angels Are Gone. Um, those are two great songs. There's a couple of cracking covers on here. Cactus, the Pixie song, and I've Been Waiting For You by Neil Young. Um, so with this record, I think, you know, we, we could really look at it and think, well, you know, Bowie's back and the cover looks fantastic as well. Um, from 2013, his 24th album uh, in um, number four, The Next Day. Um, now, you may remember when this came out, um, Bowie had been away for 10 years. And in those 10 years, there had been all sorts of rumours about his health and about uh, where he was. But he was living in New York. And as we later found out, he was having health problems, of course. Um, I cannot begin to tell you how excited I was to uh, know this when I, when I heard this album was coming out. And when the single Where Are We Now dropped... I it just it was extraordinary because Where Are We Now is one of Bowie's most beautiful pieces of music. And that is saying something for a man who's had that long a career. It was, uh, you know, I, I, it was it was it was joyous to hear him come back with a song that good, that moving, that profound. All those years um, he'd been away. It seemed like he was distilling all that wisdom and beauty into those few minutes of music. It was it was wonderful. The record itself is kind of a rock record. He's back with Tony Visconti. Um, it's a muscular sounding record. Um, and it's it's fair to say it's not consistently brilliant all the way throughout. But again, there are some brilliant moments. Um, you've got uh, the uh, stars are out tonight. Uh, Valentine's Day, the title track the next day. Again, it's it's just a little bit long um, but, and edited it down. It, it would be, you know, a, a fantastic, fantastic record. But it was very well received. And it I think because of the time it came in his career, I think it's still an essential record for Bowie Files. Um, but that brings us on to number three um, from 2016, his 25th album. And this is a very hard record to to talk about in many ways. It's it's impossible to separate Black Star from what happened around it. Bowie dropped this album on us out of nowhere. Uh, on his 69th birthday in 2016, January. And we heard it and we were overjoyed because it was a brilliant record. It was interesting. It was, it, it, there were some things we hadn't heard before in, in anyone's music. It was Bowie again at the cutting edge of creating new sounds and styles. And then two days later he died. And what's extraordinary is it's impossible to separate this record 
from what happened because and that, and that's deliberate that's absolutely deliberate i think as an artistic statement this is one of the greatest ever made by an artist and i i, I don't say that lightly i think in any in any art uh, walk of art um this is one of the greatest statements an artist has ever made um it was so brilliantly conceived it was carefully conceived from the the, the songs through to the artwork through to the timing um it's his swan song it's his parting gift he doesn't want us to disassociate the music from his death the whole thing is all part of the same package it won bags of grammys and accolades and bucketfuls of um uh, awards and things but does it stand up as an album well i think it does i think the truth is it's a brilliant record um he joined up with donnie mccaslin's jazz combo in in new york and they created this jazz art rock which just sounds fresh and it sounds new um black star is a pity she's a whore lazarus um great songs um this is a consistently great record i think and um i i cannot listen to the final track i can't give everything away without a lump in my throat i it's just it's oh you know like goosebumps now it's 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 a it's a powerful statement the whole thing um number two um his 15th album from 1983 let's dance <clears throat> now let's dance of course he teamed up with Nile rogers the idea was he'd, he'd, he'd moved over to emi they wanted a huge album they wanted hits and so the hit master general was Nile rogers of course from his uh, time with chic and um got together with bowie and did they produce hits oh my god did they ever i mean three monster hits on this album and of course let's dance china girl and modern love there's also for good measure a uh, re-recording of cat people which was a song he'd released a bit of hit a couple of years before um <clears throat> this was an enormous <clears throat> excuse me this was an enormous hit for for bowie uh propelling him into the stratosphere of, of of artists right up into the a league he'd always had respect and he'd always had loads of fans but now he was properly at the top table of of big selling artists um i love this record it gives me a warm glow um it it, it this is my ready brick record when i put this on i get that old glow the kid eating the ready brick went out into the rain but he had a lovely glow around him to protect him from the rain and the the, the cold uh, Ameri Americans watching that will have no idea what I'm on about maybe you can google it and have a look on YouTube um, but when I listen to this album I, I it just makes me feel warm and cozy I don't know why um, you've got Steve Ray Vaughan's fantastic guitar combining with that groundbreaking Nile Rogers drum sound this is 80s sounds but all the best 80s sounds you know none of that big fatuous empty vacuous process noise this is still musicians playing music um and making it s swing and funky and and it's full of melody and there's a lot of joy on this record as well it sounds like a really happy record i think maybe that's why uh it makes me feel so kind of warm and, and, and nice but there's not a bad song on it i think it's really really uh it's very understandable why it was such a huge record all the way through and unfortunately for the next few years bowie um spent his time trying to reclaim that um that sort of commercial kudos and he didn't need to um but my top bowie post 1970s album is his 14th album from 1980 scary monsters and super creeps now it feels a bit of a cheat putting a record just after the 70s as the number one but there's no denying how brilliant this record is recorded at the power station with tony visconti this album really is one of the perfect combinations of creativity and commerciality um it's interesting it's catchy it's quirky um it's rock it's art house um and it's and and, and there's, again there's not a bad song on here you've got um again the killer singles you've got ashes to ashes which was i think one of Barry's greatest ever song fashion one of his greatest ever singles um but you've also got up the hill backwards it's no game scary monsters and silver silver uh, super creeps the um the title track these are songs that lit lit the touch paper for the whole new romantic movement and then the videos that accompanied them spawned thousands of imitations i mean bowie uh, you know was absolutely still very much at the forefront of music and fashion and style influences and this album is one of his biggest and most influential visually and sonically um 
This is Bowie doing what he does best, exploring new territories musically so that others may follow. Q Magazine uh, put this uh, number 30 in, in, in the thousand greatest British albums ever. And I, I'm certainly not going to argue. It's a fantastic record and a great distillation of all the great things about David Bowie in one record. Um, well, look, there's my slightly croaky rundown today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you don't, are not that familiar with Bowie's post-70s catalogue, then I hope it's you find it helpful uh, and points you to a few things that you may have missed. Um, if you disagree, then say so in the comments below and um, let's uh, have a discussion about it. But uh, until then, um, I will see you again very soon for another episode of Rock Records Reviewed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.